So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our next presentation. Uh, Art Harmon is the president of the Coalition to Save Man Space Exploration, and he's going to be speaking to us about the Artemis Accords and the rule of law. Welcome, Art. Well, thank you very, very much, and I'm delighted to, to be with you all. You know, I've spoken at many uh, Mars societies and other conferences in the past, but this year, being online, you know, I'm delighted to be able to talk to a far wider audience than could normally attend our meetings. So uh, thank you all for having me and thank you all for uh, joining me today. Uh, so I run the Coalition to Save Man Space Exploration. My background has been in public policy. I've worked in Congress. And, uh, and, uh, and so what I deal with is a little different than what many other people speaking here deal with. They're the rocket scientists. I'm the policy guy. I'm the guy who's worked in Congress. I'm the guy who's advised uh, White House and members of Congress on what to do and not to do, things like that. So what, you know, in short, the rocket scientists who are talking here today, their job is to get us there, or as uh, Zubrin and uh, um, Elon Musk said last night, you know, the, the will and the means, uh, the ways and the means. And uh, so, uh, so I want to make sure that we have the policies, the rule of law in space so that what we can do, what we build, we can keep and we can have a prosperous society in space uh, and not great failures they would be otherwise very easy to avoid. So what I'm going to talk about today is called the Artemis Accords. And you may have heard or read about them, but in short, um, it's number one, it's important for everyone here to understand their importance. And if you haven't read them, go to NASA's website. I'll be discussing a few of the points, but go to NASA's website and you can uh, learn even more. But uh, these are important for so many reasons. There, there's 10 main principles. And what we're doing is we're getting countries, spacefaring countries and countries that want to participate in space in any way, which can mean anything from putting a uh, CubeSat up to sending people to space, to building, uh, you know, colonies on uh, the moon and Mars, anything like that. Uh, or who just thinks maybe in 20 or 50 or 100 years, we'll, we'll be doing things in space too, you know, in small countries and so forth that don't have the budgets to be doing great things. Um, so there's 10 principles in the Artemis Accords. Uh, I'm going to be discussing in particular three of these because they have uh, the, the, the most to do with uh, what we want to do, build colonies, live in space, do business in space, create uh, uh, mines so that um, we can refuel uh, spacecraft and things like that. Uh, so um, they call them principles for safe, peaceful, and a prosperous future. And essentially, the Artemis Accords seek to protect free access to space and allow ventures to have rights to their property and profits to establish a basic rule of law in space. So uh, to go through them in brief, um, the the first is peaceful exploration. All activities conducted under the Artemis program must be for peaceful purposes. So we're getting the international community to say, don't militarize the moon, don't militarize Mars, don't militarize Earth orbit. Now, of course, you know, many countries have already done that, particularly in Earth orbit. You've got these killer sats uh, launched by China and Russia to sit there and hover next to ours, awaiting a command in a time of war to go and crash into it and bust it into a thousand pieces to take out our GPS, our spy sats, our communications. Um, but by starting off at the very beginning, we hope to uh, 
get international pressure that the moon and Mars should be off limits to, uh, you know, to military activity. Transparency. Artemis Accords will conduct their activities in a transparent fashion to avoid confusion and conflicts. So let's say, and I'm going to pick on China a lot because they unfortunately have been setting some very bad examples in the world, Hong Kong, uh, Uyghurs uh, in concentration camps, uh, and uh, and uh, the seizure of the South China Sea in, in violation of 400 years of freedom of the seas and uh, international law. But I'm just using this as an example. Suppose somebody was building something on the moon and they refused to tell anybody what it was and they seem to have threatening motives. Uh, and then in come the, uh, you know, the 88 inch guns um, and you start wondering what the hell is going on. So some basic transparency, what am I going to do? Or if I'm merely, you know, setting up some a mining operation, and I might want to tell my neighbors uh, on the moon, well, I'm going to be uh, drilling for ice here, or for uh, you know whatever rare earths or helium three. Okay, fine. We know what's happening. We know what possible hazards there might be. You know, if if you're doing mining here, and you've got a base right, you know, a thousand feet away that might be a danger to the uh, habitat. So you might want to get together with them and say, could you please move it over here? Uh, that, you know, if it, it, it's kind of funny. Every, you know, grand painting of a space colony, it's got the colony dome. And then right over here is rockets launching. Well, in reality, you would want as much room between the, the rockets and your precious dome as you have at Kennedy Space Center, miles and miles, so that if something goes wrong, you know, you're, you didn't just blow up your, uh, your habitat. So interoperability, uh, and this can mean, of course, common uh, docking, uh, uh, you know, adapters. It can mean common elements of life support so that if you're out in your rover and you have a breakdown or something then and you're starting to lose oxygen well somebody else can come out and they've got a spare part because well they all plug into this common interface so the part made in china or russia or you know wherever will plug into yours and you can help each other uh, emergency assistance commit to rendering assistance to personnel in, in distress. And we kind of have that going now. We've never been able to or use it, but uh, you know, in theory, uh, what, what was the, uh, the, the movie uh, Gravity where uh, they have, I think, Chinese spacecraft and that, uh, uh, you know, to, to save the day or something. Uh, also in, uh, in, in the Martian, it was a Chinese spacecraft that I think that, that, that came and, and I, I'm kind of big on the details, but you get the idea. Uh, registration of space objects. Uh, this is particularly important today in the era of killer satellites because there are a lot of mystery satellites. They're sent up, you know, or a Russian one was sort of described as this Easter egg that has that one satellite. And then once it was up there, it spawned a couple of more. These are like their killer satellites that will then fly out to... Uh, uh, to station themselves near near others. Uh, so you want to declare that. Now, what could that mean on on the moon or Mars? It it could mean simply uh, sort of like aircraft identification. If you're flying your spacecraft around, you probably want it broadcasting your position and who you are. And you may even want some some sort of beacon or or at least a uh, uh, you know a uh, for your space base, your, your habitat saying, hi, this is a habitat, please stay clear, you know, uh, 10,000 feet or whatever. Uh, some others release of scientific data. So the Artemis uh, signatories would commit to the release of scientific information. Now that doesn't mean you have to turn over your technology to, you know, the entire world and lose your ability to have your proprietary technology. Um, but 
just general scientific information. Hey, let's let's share that. Uh, preserving heritage. Don't go uh, turning uh, Apollo 11 landing site into a tourist space or tearing it down and selling bits and pieces. Uh, and you know that that goes into the future too. So the first. Mars base, uh, things like that. Don't destroy those. Space resources. Extracting and, uh, and utilizing space resources is, is, is a key to exploration and building a sustainable human presence in the space. I'll be getting into that more, uh, as well as deconfliction of activities. Um, so this is preventing harmful interference and establishing, you know, ways to not interfere with each other's activities. Uh, and lastly, orbital debris. Uh, there will be so many more things happening in, in space, in orbit, on the moon and everywhere, that uh, you don't want to have clouds of debris from your failed experiment at, at uh, asteroid mining cluttering up the lunar orbit or Earth orbit. And so we want everyone to pledge to actually deorbit and uh, and uh, and take other steps to avoid um, debris. So let's take the uh, the three that are most important to us spacefaring uh, advocates, peaceful purposes. Uh, and you can see here that this was shot on the uh, space station where we had like nine people in space. Russians, Americans, uh, Japanese, uh, I think it was European in there or two, and uh, this is the way it should be. Um, but uh, so, um, you know, a Chinese claim to the poles, which they've talked about, they actually refer to the, uh, the moon by the name that they gave to one of the islands that they illegally tried to seize in the South China Sea. So we want to have peaceful exploration. We don't want to take, uh, you know, the conflicts we have on Earth. So um, the more we can understand, avoid misunderstandings and war, the greater opportunities you'll have to build a colony or an industry. Um, and so by saying everything should be peaceful purposes, we want to get the world, you know, fighting back should there be a claim that says we're claiming the south pole of, of the moon where all the water ice is and you can't land here, or if you do, you have to succumb to, uh, you know, our demands. Okay, so another one then is uh, space resources. And this is sort of a key for us because being able to extract and use the resources on this on the moon and mars to mine the water the minerals so we can build things uh, it's got to be done so that simply you can do it you know just like on earth you set up a mine. You you in the you know in normal parts of the world. You do you you buy the acreage and you mine it, or or it's uh, public lands or something like that, and you work out a an arrangement. Uh, but but extracting those resources is the key to sustainable exploration and habitation. So uh, we and and so if you know basically you mine it, you keep it. Now there's the Moon Treaty, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And that basically says, if you mine it, you can't have it. It's gonna be split up amongst everybody in the world. So that would destroy our ability to be a spacefaring uh, society, to go to, the, uh, um, to Mars and build something without international bureaucrats saying you can't do that. Um, so a little more on that a little later. Uh, deconfliction of activities. Um, again, this is key because particularly when you're in this, the small confines of the um, South Pole of the Moon and a little bit of water ice also on the North Pole, but 
that will test people's patience if one country or one group says we want it all. So having a structure that we can refer to, that we can uh, use international pressure is key to, um, to, to keeping, uh, um, you know, the, the moon. So in effect, the South Pole of the Moon where Artemis 2024 will go will kind of be the first safety zone. Won't be anybody else there, but eventually within a few years, we're, we want to uh, be on the moon uh, permanently and along with as many partners and companies and independent uh, people as can come along. So yeah, you would stake out your, uh, your safety zone uh, and that, that's how uh, the, you know, the deconfliction would be. Deconfliction is, uh, or, or safety zones is the term used in the accords. That's where you'll build your base, your propellant depot, your landing pad, ice harvester, and your coffee shop. Uh, and I'll be a customer to your coffee shop if you do that. Uh, so it's like property you don't own specifically, but you can control it while you use it. And that's basically sufficient for uh, most uses. Um, then, um, so these principles will protect your property rights. Now, why does this matter? Well, on Earth, you know, if you can't uh, lease, own, or control a location where you build a mine, a house, a store, or even a lemonade stand, you can't do business or be secure in your own home. And if someone forces you to share that that you built with everyone else, you'll never be able to eat. So you, you won't even bother. Um, but here's an example. A long time ago, there was a uh, big buzz about deep seabed mining. This is where the moon treaty comes in. Um, manganese, cobalt, and more were, you know, in nodules like you see on the screen, easy to vacuum up. But then something called the Law of the Sea Treaty destroyed the concept by requiring splitting your earnings with the world and sharing your hard-earned technology you might have spent billions of dollars to develop with the world. So kind of like doing business in China, you've got to surrender all your technology uh, and then all of your money too. So why would anybody do deep seabed sea mining? Well, the answer is nobody is now because it was the industry was destroyed. Now there's some deep seabed mining within countries individual uh, economic zones, but uh, uh, out in the international seas, there's none because uh, the treaty says you can't make any money on it. Uh, and uh, now the, the uh, here's, here's where the, you know, I was talking about limited areas. This is the South Pole of the Moon and the blue areas are believed water ice locations. That's where we found the signatures for water. And so this is where the land rush will be. This is where it's so especially uh, important to, to keep conflicts down, to say, yeah, okay, you, you can work that little crater there and we'll work this one. Uh, and maybe we'll share uh, uh, spaces on this really huge one uh, and so forth. And that can avoid wars. If, if you saw the movie, uh, what was the movie? Um, that came out about a year and a half ago that showed battles on the moon. Um, it was kind of funny, these tactical rovers going around with machine guns on the back. And, that was Ad Astra. Uh, Ad Astra, yes, thank you very much. So at any rate, the moon treaty similarly declares natural resources, and that would include ice, minerals, helium-3, and more uh, on uh, the moon and Mars. Uh, to be the common heritage of mankind, where you'd need bureaucrat approval to develop them. And depending on the interpretation of that treaty, merely building a base or conducting tours 
for doing non-insight to, to uh, resource utilization would would still would also require approval. Given that the United Nations puts the world's worst human rights violators on their Human Rights Council on the previous commission, you might not appreciate China, Cuba, Iran, and North Korea vetoing your use of Martian ice, right? Um, and indeed, some are now advocating uh, raising from the dead the Moon Treaty to be the overlord that would control, well, really strangle Martian and lunar development. So don't fall for the Moon Treaty being essential. Uh, the Artemis Accords and the Outer Space Treaty are far better for managing the affairs between nations and companies and independent colonies. Um, but if, if that treaty, the Moon Treaty, were to become the standard, you'd never be able to raise a dime for a colony or, or a mine or anything else. And uh, the foreign bureaucrats who would be required to approve what you want to do, they may have their own vested interests and loyalties to adversary nations. And so it would end up with either you, you can't do it or pay a lot of money and you can do it. Um, also, tyrannies like China don't follow treaties and international rules. Uh, so your surrender of your profits and technology wouldn't be matched by theirs and they would militarize the moon regardless. Um, so thankfully, the, uh, the moon treaty uh, uh, was not ratified uh, by uh, most countries. Um, the L5 society that some of you all remember uh, helped block in the US. And this is why NASA is creating the Artemis Accords instead. We've got eight signatory nations already. Um, so the whole idea is to provide for the rule of law in the space so that you can do what you want to do on the moon, Mars, uh, and, and so forth, and not, uh, not worry about you know, interference and, uh, and so forth. Mike Gold of NASA, some of you may know him, uh, he said recently that fundamentally the Artemis Accords will help to con uh, avoid conflict in space and on Earth by strengthening mutual understanding and reducing misconceptions. Transparency, public registration, deconfliction, these are the principles that will preserve uh, peace. Now, what about the countries that won't sign? Russia said they won't. China certainly won't. They intend to violate every aspect of it. Uh, Russia is turning to, be, towards becoming a very junior partner with Russia on lunar projects. And, and ruling out being an Artemis partner, uh, but they have little commercial space industry to want to protect. And they don't mind trying to harm our setting the rules for peaceful cooperation in space. China may partner in space with rogue nations like Iran and North Korea, and they all have no desire for peaceful exploration nor respecting property rights. Their space program, it's a military space pro program, it is not a civilian program. But what if they did sign on onto the accords? Well, tyrannies don't respect the rights of their own citizens nor the rights of other nations. You know, Soviets and Nazis violated treaties. China violates uh, the World Trade Organization, the Hong Kong Treaty, the Law of the Sea, uh, and so forth. So begging them to, you have to join our treaty and we'll make these concessions, no. Hey, Art, okay. we've got about five minutes to wrap up and answer questions. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So there are limits as to what uh, agreements between nations can do. They don't, you know, just like laws don't stop all criminals. But the moral suasion aspect of the accords in international, creating international pressure cannot be ignored. Uh, international pressure can indeed help reduce conflicts. Um, so throughout history, property rights have always empowered individuals and built prosperous nations. And it'll be the same on Mars and, and, and the moon. Um, and that's what we're seeking to protect. Uh, on Earth, the lack of property rights has always led to dictatorships, revolutions, and poverty. Always po poverty. One person I met in Moscow under the old Soviet system lamented, and she was standing in front of her dilapidated art apartment building 
when everybody owns it, nobody takes care of it. Uh, so in short, property rights called safety zones in the Artemis Accords are fundamental for successful colonies and economy everywhere in space, including on the moon and Mars. You know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin left the historic plaque, we came in peace for all mankind, and that's the spirit we must continue to advocate. Uh, so happy to answer any uh, questions. And of course, you all can uh, go to uh, my website, savemanspace.com, facebook.com, or Facebook and, and Twitter, it's the same, Save Man Space. So I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you all. Any questions? Excellent. Thank you, Art. Uh, we have a lot of discussion and several questions from in the chat window here. I'll ask a few of them. Uh, Bill asks, so it is okay to extract resources and use them, but no entity may sell the resources, correct? No, false, false. We, we want everybody to be able to extract and sell resources uh, to build the propellant depots, to uh, uh, build your colony and make, uh, you know, uh, cool artifacts out of moon rock and sell them and, uh, and, uh, and you know, do everything that's involved in, in, on Earth. So make and sell, profit. Next. Were there more questions? Oh, sorry, uh, I was muted. Uh, Aaron asks, how does this work with Dennis Hope's lunar embassy efforts? With what? Dennis Hope's lunar embassy efforts. You know, I, I, I don't know, you know, a lot, lot of people can create uh, great ideas, implementing them is another. Uh, perhaps this would uh, help lead to something like that. Next. Uh, Edward asks, can we trust the Trump government to live up to treaties? Well, of course. We've been trying to enforce, particularly uh, South China Sea uh, uh, and S South China Sea free access there. Uh, but it is the Trump administration that got us back on track from going nowhere in space to, uh, to planning to be on the moon in 2024. Next. Uh, from Anara, how do we bring Russia and China to the table to make a real path forward in sharing the moon? Well, this is the difficult thing. Uh, Russia has said they won't sign it. China won't either. Uh, China has described the moon in terms that make us believe that they will try to claim uh, the key parts of the moon, the south and maybe north poles of the moon where the water ice is. So, uh, you know, a lot of international uh, pressure may be all it may be what it'll take. Getting them to sign an agreement, just like other treaties that they've broken, doesn't help. It doesn't accomplish anything, but a lot of moral pressure may. Next. Edward also asks, why, don't, why won't the Trump government permit China to sign on to the Artemis Accords even if they wanted to? Uh, no, the Trump administration has not told them they cannot. We're happy to have anybody sign on. Next. Uh, from Aaron, who has the final say on the deconfliction of activities? If three nation states all want to use the same rock uh, that's going to redefine science, religion, and the world as we know it, who gets it? Well, that'll be a good question, but that, that's why you want to start thinking about this and then come up with a structure to resolve that. Next. Uh, sorry, give me just a second here. Uh, Edward had asked earlier, what nations has China stopped from using the South China Sea? Uh, virtually every nation that borders on the South China Sea, they've made uh, uh, serious threats. They, they've rammed boats belonging to various uh, countries in the area, Vietnam, probably the Philippines, uh, uh, and others, you know, their uh, claim to the South China Sea goes up to the beaches of Borneo and so forth. Uh, and, and it's, uh, uh, so yeah, they, they are threatening uh, other, other nations. All right, just as a quick reminder to our uh, attendees, the next round of track sessions has started. 
we do have one or two more questions here that uh, if Art is willing to stick around, uh, we can to, answer. And, and thank you to everybody who's uh, going off to another one. Thanks so much. So next yeah. question. Uh, so we've got a question here from Jerry. He says, this appears to promote peaceful activities for everyone's good. Can that be implemented in keeping with Trump's policy of America first? Well, of course, uh, you know, be, because, uh, you know, the, the, you, you take a look at uh, what the president has done in uh, the Middle East, where he broke a 50-year uh, log jam and has got, uh, what, three countries that have already signed uh, peace agreements in, uh, with Israel. He, he got, there was a Kosovo and, uh, uh, and so forth to make uh, peace with their neighbor, uh, uh, Kosovo and Serbia, I think. Uh, so he, he is a, uh, a, a, a peacemaker. You, you can support your own nations, uh, uh, you know, and say that what we do as a nation should be, you know, primarily for, uh, for our interest and also respecting and helping other nations to succeed. It's not an either or. We want everyone in the world to succeed. And, and we want everyone in the world to be spacefaring and uh, free to pursue their dreams in space. Next. All right. Uh, last question I have here is from Aaron. He asks, how will that work if they claim the North Pole, but they sign the Outer Space Treaty? <laughs> well, there was, there was a uh, quote that was uh, um, attributed falsely, I think, to uh, Lenin, that treaties are like pie crust. They're made to be broken. And so dictatorships break treaties. It's what they do. Uh, Hitler did, Stalin did, uh, you know, the Soviets did, uh, uh, China does. Um, and you can also opt out of uh, the Outer Space Treaty just by giving like a one year notice. So it's, it's uh, you know, th there's no penalties. Nobody's going to, if, if you violate the treaty, you know, there, there's no penalties that your country will be forever forbidden to enter space or... Uh, uh, engage in international banking or something. Was that all? Anyone else? Um, that's all the questions that I see here. Uh, does oh. anybody else have any questions for Art? Uh, Jerry just says, thank you for your answer, Art. I wasn't intending to be antagonistic myself. Sure. No, no worries. I'm always delighted to, uh, to, to hear you. Uh, and also, if anybody has their ideas on international uh, cooperation in space, and if you got the time, be happy to, uh, to hear what you have to say. Uh, so uh, type away. I have one question for you that's a little, uh, a little different, maybe. Um, we, uh, we talk about um, the rule of law in space. Um, what happens if we come across another sentient uh, species that has its own laws? And, and where does the limit of our laws end? Well, you know, each sentient race would want to, you know, both, you know, it's like when you have any two strangers meeting in, say, the high seas, and uh, we meet with them we would each want to protect ourselves we you know and that could go down to your atmosphere is poisonous your uh, you know your gut bacteria will kill us uh or whatever so it might not be quite like star trek where they're hugging and kissing uh aliens that they just met five minutes ago but uh you would want to well first learn how to communicate once you've accomplished that, then you would want to set up sort of, you know, just like you're meeting any new stranger, you know, tell us about you. We'll tell us a, you about us. Um, and then at some point you'll start saying, well, you know, we've got the bacon. <laughs> You, you, you can't leave our uh, solar system without tasting bacon. And they say, well, we've got a cool anti-gravity gizmo. We love your bacon and we'll give you a lot of anti-gravity units 
if you can load up the spaceship with bacon. So that, you know, then you start getting trade and diplomacy and everything like that, you know, so, and you would, and maybe they control, you know, 43 solar systems and uh, they, um, they say, well, you know, we're sort of the good guys in this section of the galaxy and, you know, you can affiliate with us and, uh, and it'll be a happily ever after, or maybe it's sort of like, well, you know, we, uh, we're basically Romulans. We watch your TV show. And uh, so basically we want to destroy you. Um, and uh, so, you know, then, you know, you got to fight back or whatever. But that, that of course is, well, you know, science fiction creates science reality. And because we've had people, you know, Jules Verne said, let's go to the, uh, the moon and figure it out, you know, his way of doing it. And then that became a reality. Um, and so we have today people writing fiction or writing serious proposals of how you would communicate with and uh, do diplomacy with aliens. Uh, and uh, so the human mind is a wonderful resource for problem solving and, uh, and so forth. So when that time comes, I think we'll have so many people who have the concept um, of what we should do. And so that'll be a wonderful moment in humanity. That gives new meaning to cornering the market on bacon. Um, <laughs> yeah, but hey, you, you got to promote your exports. Yeah, it seems like an interesting dichotomy that we have this 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 pact, this treaty that is uh, has blanket application across the cosmos from our perspective, but it it disregards any other um, treaties or laws that may be in force outside of our 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 own realm. Um, well, it doesn't, you know, it, it addresses what's needed now for where we are now, which is just starting, you know, the conquest of space, starting, you know, becoming a multi-planet species. And so it is what we need now for this purpose. And change is good. So hundreds of years from now, we may, uh, you know, even dozens of years from now, we may decide the Artemis Accords and Outer Space Treaty are utterly insufficient. Um, you know, there's, you go to universities and you'll find many that have space law, you know, George uh, Washington University and lots of other places. Uh, you, you can get a major in space law and it's a big thing. Uh, and so uh, you'll see more and more of that uh, God help us, though, if lawyers get into space. Um, <laughs> it's inevitable. It's inevitable, yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Art. That was a great uh, discussion. I appreciate the uh, stimulating talk that uh, promotes so much conversation and, and looking at things from different perspectives. And I think that our discussion in the chat room really uh, reflected that. So, And thank you also to all of our participants. Uh, today. Thank you all for the opportunity, and uh, and my uh, contact info is on the screen. Info at Save Man Space. Feel free to uh, shoot me an email and uh, and like us on Facebook, follow on uh, Twitter, uh, and look forward to uh, you know eventually meeting many of you at uh, and uh, chatting with many of you online. So thank you all for the opportunity. All right, thank you.